How's it going, Internet? I hope you're having a wonderful, amazing night. It is time to talk about animation and the creative process. Get into some inspiration and get into some imagination tonight. So I hope that you're ready. I hope that you're having a lovely day. And without further ado, let's get into today's inspiration, which comes from one of my top three content creators of all time. One of the most imaginative minds, I think, that... Uh, that we have today and that's um Hayao Miyazaki and um first off if you're not familiar he is basically our generation's Walt Disney um he does manga he's all the Studio Ghibli movies like Totoro and um Princess Mononoke Spirited Away Howl's Moving Castle and here's some beautiful art from the Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind uh, graphic novels. If you get a chance, definitely do yourself a favor. Pick that up. It is a great read. It's, what, probably like, uh, let's see, almost a thousand pages. But, oof, man, I couldn't, I couldn't put this thing down. I think I didn't sleep for a day or so when I was reading this thing. It's just great. This is one of my favorite of his characters. This guy right there. He's this really cool, like, old god that they bring to life. Anyways, I'm rambling. I could stare at that and talk about that book for hours. But anyways, um, he, he's just amazing. The the world that he creates and uh, the, the imagination and the, the way that... Um, well, okay, just for an aside, um, I really liked animation a lot when I was a uh, little kid. I used to, I remember watching, um, Robin Hood, Disney's Robin Hood was a huge influence on me when I was little. I just really loved, um, what I later found out was pretty much like a lot of the milk call style of a little bit more of scratchy lines in there. I liked the characterization. I liked the coloring. I liked the layout. I liked the way that everything moved, especially the Sheriff of Nottingham. If you get a chance, definitely go watch I'll have to do a video on that. I don't even know why I'm on this tangent, but I'll get to it in a second. Um, but the Sheriff of Nottingham, the way that he walks is just really great. It's one of my favorite um, walks, actually. Um, but anyways, I kind of um, pursued some other things in just real life. Came So I wasn't... Uh, animation wasn't at the forefront of my... my um, my life, kind of at that point. And then I saw Spirited Away. And... When I saw Miyazaki's Spirited Away, I just, something clicked in me. And I still didn't know that it was necessarily animation or um, concept art or whatever it is. But I knew that, like, that is what, that's what it is. I didn't know you could be so creative and really do that with animation. I don't know why, but it just never dawned on me before seeing that. that, that and then that opened up a whole world of everything. But that got me to uh, really put pretty much all my time and effort into learning to draw better, learning to animate, doing all that stuff. So he's probably, without having seen that movie at the time that I did in my life, I wouldn't be where I am. So definitely, if you haven't seen it, go see Spirited Away. I still think um, Howl's Moving Castle is actually my favorite Miyazaki movie, but Spirited Away was the first one I ever saw, and that one definitely holds a special place in my heart. So anyways... All that rambling aside, let's get a couple of quotes from Miyazaki here before we get into our work today. And this first one starts, In our work, the question is, how much you absorb from others? So for me, creativity is really like a relay race. As children, we're handed a baton. Rather than passing it on to the next generation as is, first we need to digest it and make it our own. And I thought that's a really cool way, because... Um, the, the fundamentals of art and animation and drawing and all of that stuff is really fairly similar similar to what's always been there. We want you want to get the foundations of perspective and weight and lighting and uh, you know distance and mass and proportions and all that stuff. And then once you understand all of the basics, or in animation, the twelve principles of animation. Um, then you can go in and interpret it and make it your own and add what you can to it and push it further and then share that with others. And uh, I 
think that's really important as content creators of any type is to really get down and nail the foundations, which is the person handing you the baton that came before you and then grab it and try it. And before, I mean, I guess I'm taking this analogy a little bit further, but before you even start to run, walk with that baton and really study it and learn it and build that foundation and then book it as hard as you can, as fast as you can, as much as you can. And then I think there's even, before you necessarily move it on or pass it on to the next generation, I think as soon as you understand those fundamentals, it's really important to kind of share that with other people and and, and teach and and even if you're not in a professional level, but just, I think for myself at least, I found that especially doing these videos and everything, it pushes me to continue to learn and grow and find new sources and find new things where even if I was still doing exercises every day or animation just on my own, it's not, I wouldn't get as in depth on it or really think through it the same way as I do with sharing it with you guys. So I think that's an important step too. And then the other one, the uh, other quote that I really liked from him was uh, always believe in yourself. Do this and no matter where you are, you will have nothing to fear. And I thought that was a great one too. All right, well, that was a longer intro than I usually do for today's video, but got me talking about Miyazaki and looking at my Nausicaa. Okay, we gotta look at one more picture before we get into this. I just, you got to, if you don't, pick up this book and you're a creative person I don't know it took me so long I didn't end up getting it until last year but just mm. his style I could not get enough of this anyways okay so uh, if you're not familiar with this series um, it's kind of uh, animation exercise or test or maybe an instructional video what we do is um this is the pictoplasma rig that i got off of cg meetup it's a free rig i'll have um, information down below if you want to download it for yourself and try it out i've never used this rig before um, so how these videos kind of go is um give ourselves uh anywhere from about 45 minutes to about two hours it's kind of where they've ranged um, sit down, do about 48 frames of animation, see what we get, um, try out some different rigs, see how we like them, see what we don't like about them, see what kind of ideas we can come up with through our animation, and a little bit of, um, I try to keep it fairly beginner to intermediate with um, both the, uh, the things that I do in the videos and with how I treat uh, the discussion about them. So, but do remember, if you do have any ideas or suggestions, definitely leave them down below. If there's things that you think I need to discuss more or that I'm not discussing, or I'm discussing too much, um, definitely let me know. So without further ado, let's get in here and let's uh, do some animating. Okay, so first thing we're gonna do is create a polygon cubes. Wow, I just almost said something that I didn't wanna say. Uh, we're gonna create a polygon primitives cube for some reason polygon and primitives made me want to say a different word that started with a p instead of cube which would not have been safe for work so apologies about that but uh let's see this is gonna be a uh, kind of a shorter and stumpier rig than i usually work with so it'll be interesting to see what we can get out of here first thing we want to do is create a good storytelling pose see what we can get out of this little rig here. And so far, I'm liking the way that this is laid out. It's very similar to a lot of the rigs that I've um, used. So it should be fairly easy to get into and try out without getting too worried and too caught up with um, the rig itself. Forward. 
do they have like a they do I was wondering how they were gonna do the hands on this because they're very mitt like and by mitt like I mean they're just big mitts so I'll have to it'll be fun I haven't really done a character that didn't have like any that had a hand with no fingers I've done stuff that doesn't have fingers but not really laid out the same way so that'll be interesting thought we could do more of like a grumpier walk or um, like an angrier walk kind of something like that because along with trying out the different rigs I want to not do too many that are really like vanilla we want to get more personality besides just the personality that's given from our posing and our um, rig itself and since this one seems like we shouldn't trademark <laughs> Uh, shouldn't have too many problems. I don't think I can trademark that. But uh, hopefully, knock on wood, it shouldn't have too many problems. Uh, going forward, it seems like it's pretty fairly straightforward. Just see if we can rotate just that foot. Is that gonna go? Nah. We could give it a little bit of rotate out. And we'll rotate that one out a little bit. I don't think we should probably really spread the feet further apart. It'd give us a wider gait on this one. That's a possibility, but. So before we get too far, let's go ahead and file, save scene as, and we'll just call it Pictoplasma Walk. And we are using um, Maya 2014. I know sometimes they use 2010, but this was a newer rig, so this required a newer version of Maya. I just try to stay with a little bit older versions, um, just because they tend to be a little more lightweight, which uh, is works out well for... Uh, using while recording as well so we don't get too much delay in the frame rate. Pictoplasma walk. And save scene as continue. Now let's go ahead and turn uh, show. We're just gonna show NURB curves, NURB surfaces, and polygons. And that way we don't make sure we're not keying stuff that we don't need to worry about right now. It also keeps our scene a little lighter. So let's grab all of those and let's go ahead and just hit S on the keyboard. And that'll set our first frame. And let's scale our frame range down. Let me minimize this for a second so you can see what I'm doing here. Let's scale our frame range down here to 48. So we're working within 48 frames for today. That's our goal. And let's go ahead and start laying the foundation for this walk. So, ah, uh, should we make it? I feel like I want to play with the timing a little bit since I feel like the animation will be a little bit easier. Let's play with the timing a little bit. And let's work on fives instead of sixes. Just a little, just a titch quicker than what we usually do. Usually I think walks should be based on kind of uh, 12s from step to step. Uh, that's what I find is a really good way to work for myself. That method works for me just because it's pretty easy to kind of be a little more formulaic um, with the walk, which isn't 
necessarily something you want, but when you're doing a lot of them and you're trying to do them within a time frame and everything, it's good to have a good um, base system to start with. So that being said, you know, for more polished stuff, I'm definitely going to go into whatever the scene calls for, whatever the acting choices call for and everything. But with something where, you know, this is going to be a little more of a teaching and an exercise kind of a thing, I find that it's good to have a good uh, base to start with. I've been watching this show um, occasionally uh, while I work in the background because I don't, I'm not actually really able to watch too much because most of the stuff I do is either drawing or animating so am I I'm actually going to switch back to 50 frames yeah, just because since we're doing a base 5 kind of system for our walk um, but I do get to listen to a lot of stuff and I've been listening to a lot of this show called uh, Cutthroat Kitchen it's recommended by who recommended it to me what's his name Bill Duran uh, from the morning stream uh, and it's uh, Alton Brown, who's a Food Network chef. Uh, expert? I don't know, what would you call him? A Food Network star? Really interesting uh, actor? Would you call him an actor? I don't know, he does TV shows, so I guess he'd be an actor, but he's more of a chef. Personality, I guess, would be more. Um, but it's, it's more of a... Uh, it is kind of a bit of a lean forward, so let's pull it back a little bit more and let's push that foot a little bit more forward because we still want to have some semblance of balance there. Um, but yeah, he's more of a personality, but it's a great show, and I think that there's a little element, I guess I'd like to think, or maybe something that I'd like to include more in the stuff that I do, but I think that's a kind of how I've been sort of approaching these videos is the idea of trying to master your craft very well in that um, by each time you grab a rig that we've never used before it's going to present different challenges than if you're using the same rig or you're using rigs made by the same people or anything by grabbing rigs from different sources throughout and rigs if you're not familiar are like the characters uh, sorry sometimes I forget that I try to make these uh, so at least it's kind of a beginner intermediate level um, for animation but anyways I think that by doing these videos and I definitely challenge you guys to do this stuff too definitely like trying especially while you're learning animation try and do this like walk a day give yourself a month and say you know what every day for a month I'm gonna push myself to get in and do 48 frames every day it's going to be tough and it's going to be hard and especially if you've got a lot of things going on um, giving yourself an hour a half an hour to just get into my and do 48 frames it's going to definitely help your workflow though and hopefully boost your skills a little bit better as well but that being said um going back to the cutthroat kitchen kind of discussion here and again, we're just laying the foundation here. We're going to go in and tweak this stuff. We just want to make sure the foundation is working. But I think that is a really interesting idea for people who are creative or content creators or anything sort of like that. In that, um, what they do with the show, if you're not familiar, and I guess this is going to be Casey Turbos discusses Cutthroat Kitchen Hour, <laughs> which I, I, it, it'll come back and relate. Um, but I think the idea of... Oh, we don't want to grab both of them. Let's grab the one foot here. I want to raise it up for that passing position. Um, but I think the idea behind it, what the show is, basically, is... Um, I'm just adding our passing positions in our walk here. Is they take these chefs who... There's some that are, like, instructors at the Cordon Bleu. There's some people who are just like work at the local Denny's which is an awesome restaurant by the way power to Denny's way to go Denny's who doesn't love Denny's um, this isn't an ad for Denny's I don't know why I'm talking about it but I know people who work there and they're very wonderful people so anyways um, they take these people and they put four of them in the challenge 
and they go in and they get there they're told they can go and grab ingredients for whatever it is let's say they're making um, macaroni and cheese so they go in and they have a minute to grab all their ingredients so they go and they grab the um, cheese and they grab the noodles and they grab the milk or they can make their own noodles or whatever you get the idea go in and grab all these different things and then um, they come out and then there's this auction that they do between them that uh, you can kind of basically uh, screw the person, the other chefs, by making them do all their cooking with foil utensils or taking away all their milk and making them use powdered milk or taking away all their cheese and making them use crumpled up Cheeto bits to do it. But I think there's something there for creative and content creation people is that when you're working on different projects or you're working for different people or whatever it may be, there's gonna be the times where the the budget only allows you to use foil utensils or you know the ingredients you have to use or things that you're not familiar with or whatever, but I think there's, if you're a creative person or some sort of content creator, that it's a good exercise to perpetually be pushing yourself in different ways by making it almost more difficult. I don't know if more difficult is the right way to say that, but by, let's just save our file here. We're just adding a little bit of weight over those passing positions. But by um, giving yourself restrictions, because I think sometimes restrictions help bolster creativity and that might sound weird you might think well no uh, you know complete freedom is what bolsters creativity but I think you know if with this rig away right away when I'm looking at this rig there's certain things that I can't really sell or do in this one it's a very short rig we can't get probably as good a silhouette as we would have liked so that means that we have to kind of push our posing a little bit more than we would have had to with um, a different size rig and, you know, with the snail rig that I used yesterday, if you want to watch that video, definitely it's just playlists, animation time. You can check that out on the channel. That rig was, it was working really, <laughs> this sounds cliche, I guess, but the snail rig um, was running very slowly. It was not going at speed, so I was kind of having to, while I was uh, making the animation, watch it and kind of hope that when I play blasted that it would play at speed and there weren't going to be all these hiccups so you kind of have to try and push yourself to know your craft so that you can anticipate um, the problems that you might encounter and be able to work through them. So I think it's a really good show. I would definitely, even if you're not a chef or a foodie or anything, um, encourage you to watch that show. Um, even just an episode or 15-20 minutes of an episode or whatever. And uh, and just think about how you can push that kind of an element into your own work to improve or to like kind of as an exercise to continue to push yourself to get better. I think it's really an interesting way to grow as a creator. Let's get back. Enough talking about uh, Cutthroat Kitchen. This isn't Cutthroat Kitchen time. This is animation time. But I think it's uh, definitely an interesting show. There's something to it. And I know for myself that it's kind of how it was interesting because when I was watching it, and again, here I go talking about this again, but I got it. I'm animating anyways during this time, so just going to add a little bit of offset in the chest from the sway of the hips and the rotate of the hips here. But there's something in that show that was very similar to kind of how I'm trying to approach uh, these videos and tutorials because not only am I trying to do it so, you know, it's instructional 
a bit so if you're fairly new to animation you can learn something or if you've been doing it for a while you can feel like there's a buddy with you down in the trenches who is learning along with you and growing with you um, as you're learning but also I you know a lot of this stuff I'm doing to uh, to challenge myself and to push myself and to, to make it so that I can adapt easier with in animation and things that I probably wouldn't have done before or approaches that I wouldn't have done and also I think it gets those creative juices flowing because by giving yourself a restricted amount of time to create something which is another thing they do in that show which is like the one of the things you can do to um, hurt your opponents is to uh, like take away time so they have to sit there and not like let's say they have 30 minutes to make that macaroni and cheese that we were talking about earlier and their opponent can take away 10 minutes so then they only have 20 minutes to create it which means that they have to kind of restrict a little bit with what they were doing they might have to change and think on the fly and be able to create and do stuff at a moment's notice with whatever challenge comes um, into play i th think there's a good practice to get into especially if you're um, just starting out or you're at hitting one of those plateau points in your growth as a illustrator animator website designer clothing designer whatever it is okay, let's go ahead and save what we're doing here Let's go ahead and take the um, up position that we have on the translate Y's and we're going to delay those a frame so that there's a more of a stomp to that foot. There's more of a distance that it'll travel up and down in a shorter amount of time so it'll make those steps heavier. a little bit of drag and then stomp down since we don't really have toes to work with here gotta kind of improvise I like this little rig though uh, from what I was, the quick little reading that I was doing about this rig before I uh, got into animating with it, I think I'm bumping the mic here, gotta be careful, um, it seemed like there were a lot of customization options, I'm not really seeing that built into the rig itself, so I wonder if that's something that, uh, that they have with add-ons or something, there were a lot of uh, different customized versions that I found of this rig, so definitely check that out if you're looking at this uh, rig as well. And again, I will link it in the information below. Let's add a little more up and down as well on the hips here. We just added some up with that and some more down. Save off what we have here. It's feeling pretty good already. It's the hip controller. Let's 
for some reason. I was thinking I missed the lower spine, but I didn't. Okay, I'm just gonna save that off again real quick. Now let's add a little bit of rotate just into the uh, hips, which is different than the cog controller, because this one should just do the hips and not have it affect the rest of the body, albeit it'll affect the legs a little bit. But It's going to be a little bit quicker steps with a little more of a lean to the front. So I think we added some character into this guy. And that's one of the things that you want to do is really... So what do they say about animation? Animation is acting with a pencil. But in this case, since we're doing 3D computer generated animation, this would be what acting with the keyboard, mouse. Stylus. Pick whichever one you like. I tend to not animate with my Cintiq very much. I don't know. I mean, I do with my hand-drawn stuff, but in Maya, it feels more easily manipulatable with uh, mouse and keyboard for myself. If you have any good guides or suggestions for how you like to use Maya, definitely comment down below. And I'll check them out or share them with anybody else if I... Uh, find stuff that works for me as well. That's another thing that I really would like to, um, again, I know that I've only really been doing these videos for a couple of weeks now, and the audience for this stuff is not like if I was doing Taylor Swift videos, so I realize that it's not as big, but I still think there's a community out there of people who are wanting to learn to animate and, uh, you know, sometimes I think animators, though we're perpetually busy, I feel like it's sometimes a lonely sort of art form. And by that I just mean um, I spend a lot of time staring at the screen, so I find that I listen to a lot of podcasts or YouTubers or audiobooks or obviously Cutthroat Kitchen, which I was talking about earlier. But I wanted to try and have some sort of a more of a consistent animation voice and kind of audio presentation. Because though there are some animation podcasts, which are really great, especially, I believe it's just called The Animation Podcast with Clay Cadis. Awesome. Definitely check it out. I don't know if he still currently updates it. Apologies that it has been a little while since I listened to it, but that was one of the first um, animation shows or podcasts or discussions that I ever listened to, and it's what helped me make the choice to go to uh, Animation Mentor, which was like, one of the greatest greatest times of my life when I first went to Animation Mentor. Unfortunately, when I, um, I had to take a little break because of real life issues, but it made it a little more difficult um, when I ended up finishing um, school than when I was first starting, but it was a great experience. If you get a chance, definitely take some classes there, or at least watch. Um, they have a YouTube channel. Uh, I think it's just youtube.com slash animation mentor but they do these um uh, critiques that you can actually just watch here on youtube and if i set it up right there should be a link to their channel in my like suggested channels or similar channels so definitely subscribe to their channel as well because um, i know a couple of my teachers have done um episodes that might be too much bounce in there because that head's so big and i have to really scale that down That's a, that's a great thing. But in, anyways, I think my whole point getting around back to it uh, was that I, I'd really like um, to create this animation time to be more community-based, where, you know, if you have um, animation you're working on and you'd like an extra pair of eyes uh, or you wanted to to discuss different topics or read different animation books that we could talk about or any sort of thing like that. Um, I 
definitely like to incorporate a lot more of that. Uh, yeah. So definitely let me know down in the comments below if that's something that you're interested in, if you like the idea behind this, uh, if you think, I just felt like that was kind of something that is, that a lot of gaming communities and movie communities and music communities and all of these different art forms have, you know, people who do daily shows about them. I mean, all the time, but there really isn't an animation one. And so I think somewhere between PBS's Bob Ross and, you know, uh, the Morning Stream or a podcast or something and, you know, digital tutors videos, I just kind of think that there's a niche there that, that definitely... Uh, I think there's a, an audience for that and I hope that um, we can get there together you and me and invite your friends or, or tell anybody um, you know shoot me suggestions you can tweet me at caseyturbos.com and I'm a lot more chatty tonight so I think it makes up because yesterday I was kind of quiet when I was doing my video just kind of hunkered down with that snail rig what do you think is he a little too forward balance maybe let's pull these hips just a little bit. I'm trying to get it so that there's a nice line of action, but I don't want to offset the weight so much. Maybe I'll just pull this foot. We do need to do a little bit of uh, keep alive, maybe overlap. I kind of want to keep more of a straight arm with this one. I think that idea is working well, but with having basically no bend in that elbow, that's not helping anybody. So let's have it swing forward there and swing back there. Swing forward there and back there. Swing forward there. pretty good. It feels just about right. Let's kind of try and find a balance between the extremes from when we were setting those. And that should be about right. I do feel like this could come back maybe a little bit less. I think this is gonna be one of those things where we just kind of noodle a little bit with the weight. Just so that it feels a little more balanced. I think this planted foot might need to come forward a little bit more. reason I feel like this back foot isn't uh, raising up as high as that the foot that's uh, closer to camera so let's check the values on that I think I already evened them out so maybe what we need to do is just raise them up a little bit more let's check the rotate X's as well kind of even those out a little bit more and again we don't want to make it completely robotic and even but have a little more uniformity so that it doesn't feel like one foot's going one way while the other foot's going a different. So let's see. Yeah, let's do a little bit of uh, 
rotate Y in the wrist as well. And we'll probably delay that a frame from what we have it. We do want to kind of pass what our original key was over here, so it overshoots it. And let's go ahead and grab all of that, and we're going to delay it one frame so it doesn't hit at the same time that that forearm's hitting it. Okay, let's go ahead and save what we have, and now let's get into that other arm. This one, bring it straight out, and then bring forward. I gotta be careful about intersecting through that thigh now. For some reason, I guess I didn't catch that before, so probably have to adjust the rotate Z in the upper arm there so that we can have it swing out a little bit more. So let's see. First off, I don't think that I balanced out the rotate Ys very well in the upper arm either. Okay. Now it's swinging back way too much. You'll see there's kind of a break in the elbow, and that's okay. We don't, sometimes in animation you exaggerate things a little more than you need to. Now, we don't want to do it way too much, but um, if we didn't really have this frame where it would feel like it's kind of almost hyperextending, um, if you frame through a lot of human movement there are some weird screen grabs you can grab. I was listening, I was watching, um, what was that? I think it was an interview with uh, Jason Alexander and Larry David, this guy from Seinfeld, for some reason I was stumping on his name. Let's see. And uh, something came up and I had to um, pause the video and go do something or I was listening to some audio that well, on something I was working on um, and so I paused it on this one screen grab of uh, Jason Alexander who is uh, George from Seinfeld if you're not familiar and he was making this wonky just mushed up face but all he was doing was like making an F sound <laughs> but for some reason he was also like trying to make it a little more intense for the thing he wanted to say so he really did a lot of intention with while the mouth was making that <laughs> kind of a noise and it just ended up being this really really pushed and squashed and uh, extreme uh, if it was a key in an animation, people will, would probably say, oh, that's a little push too far. But it was real, and it, it, when played at speed or when watched like we would anyone talk, you know, it didn't look pushed at all. But just because I happened to have paused it on that one frame, it definitely 
that would not be the picture that uh, someone would probably put as their cover photo for anything. Let's go ahead and add a little bit of bounce on the head here. Now we're going to have to really do a minimal job. Uh, what do I do? On uh, this one because this head is so large that any sort of movement we do to it is going to show up a lot. So we have to be careful and we'll probably have to tone this down a whole lot. Keep defaulting to a six frame base instead of a five frame base. Just remember to keep it on ones and sixes and on play. Okay, now watch. Just because we did that, hmm, that's actually not as extreme as I was picturing it would be. This is the neck, so we're going to do the neck and the head, so that'll probably amp it up a little bit. Back. Mm -hmm. Back. way too much. So let's take all the rotate there, and first of all we'll even them out. I haven't been doing much graph editor stuff on screen, I apologize. Got I really feel like if you're a person who uses Maya, and honestly, I have a hard time doing <laughs> hardly any sort of work on a computer these days without using two screens. So if you aren't, if you're an animator and you're not using two screens, uh, A, why not? B, do you like it? Why do you like it? Is that workflow more helpful for you? Do you feel more streamlined? And C, you should try using two screens. I have, I, I one thing that I would really like, and maybe you guys know a solution, but I'd like to be able to, um, I think it just means I need to get another video card, which means that I need to, not that my video card's bad, but a second um, video card should do a rundown of what I have on my machine. It's not super great. It's awesome, knock on wood. Um, it's not super extreme, is what I meant to say, but it's pretty pretty solid. Let's me do the things that I need to do. But what I'd like to do, getting back to the point, is um, be able to have two monitors and my Cintiq that I can use so I can move things around, because I tend to not like to uh, do a lot of the graph editor on the Cintiq, but I've been doing it for so long that it's kind of become natural. But before I had one of these, I liked the bigger um, area that I could use with the second monitor. That being said, I don't know if you can see through the reflection. Let me see here. You can kind of see. Wonder. I have another monitor right here and a laptop right there, so I do have a lot of things going. And then the. Uh, so I need to use that more. It's just pretty much Google Class, Google Cast, Chromecast in the background, just so there's some more intrigue in the background behind here. I was planning to have more videos there, but I, the more I got reading about um, a lot of copyright stuff with animation, it's just...
lot to, uh, I feel like I would be not having the rights to a lot of the stuff that I would be using, and I don't want to do that. In my younger days, I might have been more about, um, younger days, how freaking old do I sound? My goodness. Um, more about, you know, stick it to the man, but whatever. But these days, with the, with the amount of time that, you know, stuff takes to make, and the amount of big business that's in the world, I really am all about, you know, if I can afford it, I want to donate directly to the person who created it, you know. And I don't know that I necessarily want it unless I can do that. Like, I'd rather just wait till I can afford it and then give the money to the person who created it so they can know how much, you know, I personally appreciated what they were doing. Let's do a little bit of index spread. Is that going to work? Yeah. Index back. Then we can delay that frame. Then we'll add a little more overlap into those mitts there. And we'll go ahead and delay that frame as well. There's any translate on the belly. It is a little bit. What about on these hips? Maybe I'll do it on the hips. Do a little bit of translate up and down. I'll add a little bit more of that sense of squash and stretch and bounce to the uh, hips here. And we'll probably have to minimize that a little bit more. And before I get too far away from it. I do need to add that extra um, spread into the other mitt hand, glove hand thing on this pictoplasm rig. I really like this rig. It's a little bit short and stocky, which adds a lot of character to it, but I feel like that would be a little bit more restrictive, so it wouldn't be as many... That's not true. That sounds like a cop-out. Um, it's just I feel like... I like getting a good silhouette in my posing, and this one would would pose that that would take a little bit longer than uh, I feel is necessary. So that means I probably won't use this rig a ton, but I do, I mean, it seems to be easy to animate. It deforms pretty well. It's got some nice stuff going on in it. Maybe we could add a little bit of uh, translation just a little bit, just so there's a little bit of squash and stretch there. Just do feel like there's enough m movement or change of shape in that upper body, so maybe this will help. And animation is all about change of shape. You don't want to have too much stuff that's just static, especially in 3D animation. I know I kind of mentioned this before, but I think it's important to mention again. Um, with 3D animation, you have to find that sweet spot between uh, I key to frame on one and I key to frame on four. I duplicated that key, so it's a flat. There's no movement between it. And then I key to key, uh, key on one and I key to key on four, and I just pick two arbitrary things, so it's just kind of floaty in between the two. You want to get a nice minimal amount of movement but still some what they call keep alive because in human beings I can sit here and I can stare right into the camera I'm not moving I'm just looking straight into the camera obviously my mouth is moving and now my hands are but you know what I mean um, but that being said all the cells in my body are moving you know, I'm breathing my heart's beating all of that stuff there are tons and millions of micro movements going on throughout that and in hand-drawn animation, just by literally tracing, you know, a key from one cell to the next, um, you can get that little bit of micro-movement, because even if you're an excellent artist, there's going to be a little variation in your lines, which will add a little bit of that 
It's not like a flicker. If you're doing it so that it's a flicker, then you're probably doing it wrong. But there's a little bit of, uh, let's say this was line one and this is line two. Let me make sure that I'm doing that setup in the. Uh, that, okay. Let's say we were doing four frames that we were holding and this was frame one and this was frame two and this was frame three and this was frame four we were just holding a straight line and bear with me with the example but in cg it would just look like this nothing nothing moving nothing moving but if you were duplicating it in animation it would look like this was the first one and this was this and hand drawn so you want to add a little bit of variety in there and make sure that it's not holding and sticking too much I'd like to get a little more into the head, but I feel like it's working well enough that I don't really need to. Maybe we could add just a little bit of squash and stretch in there. But I don't want to do too much. Because a little goes a long way. It's like salt in a dish. Or in a a meal, you know? A bit of salt is really gonna bring out the flavor, but too much, and it's gonna taste like nasty, salty stroganoff. And I'm saying that loudly because there's this one time, and I guess I'm just gonna tell you this story, that I was not very good at making beef stroganoff for the Sarah, and it tasted like a giant salt lick. That being said, I'm not a fan of beef stroganoff to begin with, so I didn't really like taste it very much while I was making it. And I salted the noodles, and then I salted the meat, and then I put them together, and it was just salt enough. Salty stroganoff. <laughs> and if you can hear in the background, that was a comment from the Sarah about my stroganoff just tasting awful. So thank you for that. I did. Because I think it's an important point in life that a little bit can sometimes go a long way. What's that? Casey's coronary stroganoff? Yeah. Oh, thank you. I guess, see, this is why I didn't want to bring up the stroganoff, folks. This right here, because she won't let up all night. She's going to talk about how awful that stroganoff was. It's going to happen. Squash and stretch is really working. So let's really exaggerate it and see how it feels when we over exaggerate it. Okay. And let's reverse what we have and then over exaggerate that. Okay, let's delay it two frames. And then we'll scale it back. And it's always um, with animation, unlike with stroganoff, because you can't really unreverse sprinkling salt. Um, it's always okay to go too big and scale it back with the animation. Just delay it one more frame, and then we'll just scale it back a bit more. Let's see. Just too much. Okay, kind of just barely have any in at all. Just so there's a little bit of change of shape there to it. Okay, let's go ahead and add a little bit of uh, drag in there. And then we do have to readjust that arm too because we're still getting that intersection there. I'm not too worried about it. Should be a quick fix. Should be. And index spread, let's go back in and we'll adjust those values here. And here, and here. And delay to frame. Okay, let's go. What's that now? Just don't 
don't think we did enough on there. Let's make that change of shape that we need. And then let's go ahead and do a little bit more rotate Z out so it's not so close to the hips. And same with this one. That seems pretty good. So let's see. Let's go ahead and save our file here. And I think it's a good time to uh, start winding down too because I'm having a visit from, let's see, if she'll stop playing with my foot while I'm working, from a little babysitting meepy cat. We found her in, uh, she was found. And we were just helping take care of her uh, in a park, and there were a bunch of little kids being mean to her, so rescued her, and then now we're helping to uh, take care of her for a little bit. But she can get a little rambunctious. But anyways, this is not... Let's talk about the cat that we're helping to rescue time. This is animation time. So uh, let's look at it from all angles and see if it's working here. It's a good thing to do. Spin it around. Make sure the weight's working. Make sure the movement's reading. It looks like it's pretty good. So let's go ahead and one thing I am going to do here is I am going to scale this guy down a little bit. So let me here. No, I'm getting there. For some reason, I'm getting a little bit of uh, error here. So I'm just going to save off the file here. And I think we're just going to wrap this up and I'll finish that part up uh, in a little bit. Just because I'm getting some errors and I don't want to lose the file. Either my recording file or the animation for today. So let's go ahead and turn our NURB curves off just so we can see what it's looking like after that. Feels pretty good. Got definite some determination in this walk it's a little heavy forward so it definitely would not be able to stop at this point it would still have to continue to go forward a little bit more uh, just because the weight would be there actually I think we could probably even push that foot forward a little bit more just a little bit more maybe something like that yeah that feels a little better this step forward a little bit more too. Just a little bit more. Got some kind of stompy feet and got some swinging arms. They really do kind of favor that straight there. And we got a little bit of wobble in the head to keep it alive. Got a bit of up and down in the hips, a little bit of side to side. Yeah, I think that's working pretty well. Okay, let's go ahead and turn our nerve curves off so we don't see those distracting us. Let's right click here and we'll play blast this as Pictoplasma Walk. And play blast that just so we can see it probably a little bit better at speed there. All right, well, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you do, remember to throw me some thumbs up. Uh, let's pull up those quotes and read through that one again. Uh, always believe in yourself. Do this, and no matter where you are, you will have nothing to fear. I think that's a great quote to go on with your day about. Remember to uh, keep pushing yourself, keep trying new things, uh, keep working hard in whatever creative field that you are working in. And I hope you guys have a wonderful and awesome night tonight. Thanks again for watching. You guys are amazing and wonderful and awesome. And we'll see you for some more animation tomorrow.